let's get this started. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which part of the world you're connecting from. My dear experts, hello. I will do a proper intro later, but let me say hello to you too. Hi, good morning. Hello. Hello. Hello, Yanis. And I see that people are joining as we have started. I want to welcome you to, to a webinar that is live, which means that whatever we do and we say uh, maybe has been uh, tested before, but it's coming out live, not rehearsed. Uh, I'm looking forward to a very, very interesting conversation about one of the topics that I really love and enjoy working on and discussing about changes in the food industry and how does technology is bringing, pushing, accelerating, or in sometimes in some cases, even imposing this change. Eh? And it's going to be a lot around digital, a lot around AI and other technologies that are changing the way that we do things in food safety and quality. So let me get us started. I, I was hoping uh, in one of the webinars that we had uh, a couple of years ago, talking about digital transformation again, I was hoping that the environment, the situation around us would have changed. But I have to admit that, again, we are under tremendous pressure. The supply chain is under tremendous pressure. The environment in which people in food safety, quality, supplier assurance positions are uh, is still uh, under tremendous pressure. We were just having a, a relaxed conversation that was all about reorganizations and mergers and acquisitions and changes in organizations the budget restrictions that come with the different types of economic crisis around the way that people are working, the, the habits, the routines uh, have been changing again from fully present to fully remote and now back to hybrid or fully present again. People are not all, also the same. I think that this is something that I hear a lot in conversations about uh, the, the the generations that are being uh, employed and engaged in uh, in food safety roles. That as new people are coming on board, this is bringing a hell lot of new uh, requirements and challenges. How can we bring the gaps between the different generations of people that are dealing with these activities? Everything is becoming more digital, so does compliance. And I will come back a little bit on that later. Whether the way is we are producing food is sustainable, is becoming a necessity, uh, an important factor in the way that we are assessing where ingredients are being sourced from or the way that suppliers are working to deliver this uh, as an input. And of course, again and again, day after day, week after week, something comes, something happens, and it hits as a, as a crisis. And uh, un unfortunately, this is something that doesn't stop. And this is the daily situation that people in safety and quality uh, assurance have to deal with. Eh? And I already said that the, the digital part of this landscape, the requirements that regulators are requesting or enforcing are becoming more strict, are becoming more complex. These are two of my favorite examples. They come from uh, the FDA, the US FDA, and they have to do with the ways that we have to collect, maintain, and manage digital records 
in order to support either traceability purposes or evaluating and maintaining records on foreign suppliers. And it's very, very similar or it's even more strict uh, in other geographies. So everything is becoming more digitally uh, required. And in, in, in our conversations, in our, in our work and in the interactions that we have with uh, other people in the market, I think that we see this being organized, this, uh, this conversation being organized or grouped around three main topics. And I, I really like to see them as transformative pillars. Everything that has to do with software, how can we move away from manual tasks, paper-based tasks, or even spreadsheets that are used to support decisions? How can we incorporate more software applications to support these decisions? How can we take advantage of all the data that is out there and all the resulting insights and information that we have in a combined way and not a disconnected way so that information can be better informed? And which is the role that technologies that are extremely new and innovative, or at least their applications becoming now streamlined, like artificial intelligence, how can we take advantage of this radical change that AI is bringing into becoming practically better informed and more proactive? Eh? So that's the topic of the webinar. Uh, it's open to everyone. I think it will be of extra value and interest to people that are already starting such a transformation journey, are considering to start such a transformation journey, or are in the middle of such a transformation journey. We will try to cover questions starting from which are the technologies that matter. Is there something that I should be looking at because it's relevant? How do other people or companies use this kind of technologies? Any good use cases? Any bad examples that we should avoid? What about AI? What's the role of AI? What does AI mean in this transformation? At the end of the day, what is this that we should keep in mind when we are starting or already have a bark in such a journey? These are some of the questions that I think we will answer, and I hope that we will answer. And I think I have the, just the right people together to have this conversation. Quincy and Yanis. Quincy, I will start with you. You have a, a, a management consulting background, but so much experience in the sector. And you're also facilitating a, a group of very important stakeholders at SAFE. Tell us a little bit about you. Good morning, Nikos, and uh, and thanks for the invite. Thanks for uh, for inviting us to talk a little bit about all of these new and emerging technologies, including AI and the impact that that can have on the industry. Yeah, so I've been the executive director of SSAFE since 2013. Uh, SSAFE is a global nonprofit membership organization. Um, you can see the logos of our members uh, around uh, around me. Uh, they did about half a trillion dollars worth of food business last year. So um, they're, they're quite essential to the entire uh, food industry, the food sector, uh, and in feeding the world. So uh, very, very happy to be here and talk a little bit about some of the work that we've done on Industry 4.0, the guide that we have, and hopefully share some useful knowledge and useful information during uh, the session today. Thanks. Wonderful to have you here connecting from Colombia, Quincy, and uh, from my neighborhood and uh, working closely together. I have Yanis, the CTO, which means responsible for everything that we do in technology and data and analytics. Uh, welcome, Yanis. Tell us a little bit about you. 
It's a great pleasure that um, I'm very happy to be in this uh, webinar uh, because I'm following this transformation, this digital transformation for more than 15 years now in the organizations, but also in the, uh, uh, in the food companies. Uh, and I come from, as you mentioned, I come from the technology uh, side, uh, but still working with, for many years uh, with uh, the food companies and the organizations. Uh, I I am trying to understand very well which are the challenges and uh, trying to help in this transformation, uh, mainly focusing on the risk monitoring, risk assessment and the risk prevention uh, part of the work, of the very important work that uh, these uh, organizations and companies are doing. So it's great having me. It's great to be here, and I'm looking forward for this uh, interesting discussion. Thank you, gentlemen. So this is what got you and me here in the webinar, but I, I'm really looking forward to finding out why our participants are here, why our audience is here. So a poll is already there. You just click on uh, the answer that indicates What's more interesting for you? Does it have to do with software applications? Did the data part attract your interest? Or is it the AI and predictive topic that got your attention? That's interesting. I see most of the people responding that AI is the reason why they're here. But let's see how this goes. And at the end, we will do, a, a, if we have enough time, a bit of assessment. Where, where do we think that we stand after the webinar? So let me end the poll. If everyone has responded, are you OK, my dear audience? I will end the poll now and share the results. Do you see the results? the majority of the people responding have said that they're here for AI. Oh my goodness. But we do have representation from the people that want to learn more about software applications and the data fanatics. Thank God. Okay, let's see how this goes. I will try to put things a little bit in context and uh, a bit in context, uh, sharing some of the experience that I see in our work, uh, working with organizations, larger or smaller organizations that are trying to deploy such technologies. And such technologies means from simple digital technologies that automate a task that is taking place now either using paper forms or uh, even a spreadsheet. And uh, even technologies that are more advanced, more complex, more sophisticated and innovative, more expensive, uh, that don't have a, a direct, clear uh, value. Or some cases that are a little bit more uh, fresh, new, and we, we, we are going there exploring possibilities. Huh? So what I hear from colleagues in the market, uh, I hear people and teams that take the decision to do a serious in-house investment. They are developing things internally. Two weeks ago, uh, we had this conversation with uh, some colleagues from a food manufacturer in the US. They started developing a solution to support their manufacturing locations. And then they decided to spin this out and offer it as a service, as a solution to other companies as well. Eh? So in some cases, this might result in a, in a business line or even a revenue line on its own coming out uh, from such an investment. And then I also hear from other colleagues that they don't think and believe that 
the food business should be in the technology business. This is something different. There are plenty of technologies out there. There are plenty of specialized companies doing this and offering solutions. What they do is that they select the right solutions that are appropriate for each one of the problems that they have to solve. Now, these are the cases where we have a strategic view in either investing internally or selecting solutions. I've heard several colleagues saying, we don't care. We let our teams be autonomous. We let them decide if they want to use something. It doesn't matter if it is coming uh, from an internal team or an external team, but they will decide as long as, as they're solving something that they're facing as a challenge. And then we have also several people that are more skeptic, especially as far as uh, innovative technologies as, as are concerned. They want to first make sure that someone else uses this, proves return of investment and value, and then they will go to the best practice and adopt it. I'm not saying that one approach is better than another. I'm just sharing some of the approaches that I've heard people following. Quincy, Yanis, what about you? Did, what do you hear from the market? Any Anything different? Any option that is a little bit more popular? Well, it's still early days, right? Uh, depending on what kind of technologies you're looking at. And um, as we're seeing more and more new technologies emerging, uh, the recommendation, at least from within as safe and, and based on the experience of some of the as safe members has really been around developing strong multidisciplinary teams, particularly when we're talking about medium and large size food businesses, right? Uh, to make sure that when you're making decisions on what kind of technology to bring in, that you include your food safety quality people, you include your regulatory people, you include your IT people, you also include finance, and you also include HR, because people need to be trained on the technology as well. So our recommendation really is bring together a multiple multidisciplinary team um, to make sure that everybody across the business knows what technology you're bringing in, why it is that you're bringing it in, how you're going to implement it, and how you're then going to focus on maximizing the amount of benefit that you can get out of the investment in those mm -hmm. new technologies. So I hear you saying that it's a quite strategic uh, decision. It requires a little bit of mobilizing, utilizing resources internally. Yanis? I am very much aligned with what we are discussing and what you have described, Nikos, about the different approaches. Indeed, uh, the speed of the adoption um, uh, it is... It, it has different uh, variances. Uh, it varies from uh, organizations and companies that uh, they are more keen and uh, they can uh, deploy uh, even large solutions, large digital technologies uh, inside their organizations quite fast and efficiently, but uh, having also others that need some more time uh, and uh, they need carefully to examine which are the workflows that they, they need to enhance and they want to make smaller steps, even, for instance, aiming at a one deployment every year uh, or having uh, an important de deployment uh, to be uh, realized within a timeline of two to three years. So there are different approaches uh, that, that I see. It depends, of course, I agree that it depends on the on the size of the organization, the size of the company. Uh, so both in some cases, it's better if you have, you still are a very large company, but if you're uh, a bit smaller, you can be more flexible, but uh, it's uh, also a matter of the structure that you have, uh, how much IT support you have internally to be able to support mm -hmm. this kind of things, how much training you can 
uh, apply in these cases. So yeah, I definitely I see different approaches. And I, I hear you saying that time and the way that you want to approach it time-wise and plan and deploy and plan and deploy something like this in terms of the timings is critical in selecting uh, the approach at the end of the day and mobilizing the the right resources. Uh, I think I also also heard you a little bit talking about some of the challenges. I want to share a couple of them that um, I'm hearing very often about. Uh, my favorite one, I think, is uh, the first one because it's a it's a trap, it's a pitfall that it's is very very easy uh, to to fall into and then to to devote significant amount of energy and resources because suddenly the priorities are driven by technology suddenly what is happening what is happening in the whole transformation uh, project is not driven by the business uh, needs by, but by the preferences or the requirements from the people uh, responsible for the implementation part of it eh? mm -hmm. or I've, I've also heard sometimes uh, about cases where using different solutions, especially from external parties and providers, uh, turns the project into an arena where they, 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 there is the need to manage competing priorities. Eh? Instead of using solutions to solve two different problems, uh, that the organization is facing, you have the two suppliers uh, trying to impose their own agenda, and then it becomes uh, a different, uh, a different type of uh, challenge. Uh, another challenge that I see is when we have full independency teams selecting their own solutions and uh, and tools. It's very easy to to for something like this to become uh, disconnected from the main strategy and having the team that is independent uh, and autonomous solving very quickly something uh, in a very flexible and agile way, they also become disconnected and they have their own agenda, their own priorities, and you're trying to get them back to what you're trying to do. Uh, uh, more centrally or strategically. And the last one, I, I think that I see two versions of it. One version is where we have lots and lots of investment, lots and lots of planning, lots and lots of implementation and development and initial versions, etc. But it never gets to the end. It never fully delivers something that people can use, it becomes a black hole that is consuming time, money, energy, and it never flies. Or another version is that it takes too long and it's eventually abandoned before it actually delivers. So it takes three years to see the full potential of such an investment. After a year, there is no immediate uh, benefit and the project is killed and forgotten. But these are some of the the stories that I hear. I don't know if you have similar stories to share, guys. Other types of challenges that you've heard about or seen about? Jans, you want to start? Yeah, yeah, I can I can start. So the only the only thing that comes into my mind it's it's important in terms of challenge is that uh, uh, it, now that the companies have deployed many different uh, systems, uh, a new challenge is uh, in front of them, uh, the integration of these systems uh, and how uh, how difficult it is to connect the different the data from the different systems in a such a way that can facilitate very much the assessment, the prevention of the food safety risks. So this is what I see very much. I see uh, leaders in the very large manufacturers 
to be worried about the data inconsistencies, about having various systems and not having uh, the technical expertise internally to understand which are the issues with the data and they cannot have uh, a good integrated view that they need, for instance, when they are assessing a supplier or when they are assessing a, an ingredient. So this is the only challenge that uh, important challenge that I would like to add uh, into the, your points. Mm -hmm. And we will talk a little bit more about data in a while. Quincy? Yeah, I think as like you mentioned earlier, you mentioned uh, FISMA 204, right? And traceability rule. Uh, we're seeing some issues around that already, right? Uh, how How is the information and the data going to be um, going to be collected and how is it then going to be uh, shared uh, both with the FDA as well as within the organization? Is it going to be interoperable? You're talking there about competing third-party solutions. If every major business in the U.S. starts using different technologies, uh, there's going to be some challenges there. So on that front, as I say, we're, we're both talking to the adjacent group and the uh, and the best practice group that they are setting up as well as the GS1 and see where some standardization there can help. Uh, I think the other key point as well is that, look, there's a lot of turnover in terms of people within businesses these mm -hmm. days, right? I mean, uh, my, my dad worked for the same company for 38 years. Uh, I certainly have it in my career. So with that turnover, the point that you made earlier, it's fundamental that when you're investing in these technologies, one is that you're very clear as a business what the problem is that you're trying to solve with the technology. And then secondly, that it is directly aligned to uh, the business's objectives and where it wants to go, because people will leave, but the technology will stay and will it's therefore still be functional for the actual business. And those are some of the things you really need to think about early on before you start investing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in a new technology, uh, because otherwise if people leave or the strategy changes, you can basically take all that investment and throw it in the bin. That's interesting. And I like the fact that you're bringing the human factor forward. This is something that I haven't thought about, but you're absolutely right. It can become a challenge on its own, especially when we're talking about technology, eh, where uh, turnover is even uh, higher, I think, or at least the opportunities for people are, are more. And then I, I heard both of you highlighting data interoperability. So let's let's take the step to to dive a bit deeper in into the three areas uh, that I that I mentioned earlier, the, the key pillars that I see. Uh, first of all, I want us to start with the basics, to the extent or the degree that we see software applications taking over or supporting or automating manual uh, work to to a big extent. I want to hear about what you see in the market, what you hear, which are the experiences that you have to share. And uh, Jan, I will start with you. Great. So in terms of the software systems, I see very large manufacturers deploying uh, systems in order to manage suppliers, manage the product life cycle, uh, the quality processes, uh, to store and manage laboratory testing data. Uh, to to implement a better risk monitoring, risk assessment and prevention uh, approach. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, it's it's a challenge so of the, at the same time deploying so many systems, so many different systems. Uh, so from all these systems, I will focus more on sharing my experience on, uh, on, on, on the software system that can be used for uh, risk monitoring and uh, risk assessment. So uh, I see uh, very large uh, manufacturers uh, to use uh, a system like Fudakai every morning to scan what has been announced globally concerning the products, the finished products that they have, the ingredients and the suppliers. This helps them to save uh, many hours of visiting the website one website after the other and discover the information and understand if this is the same information or not. So this is one use case that I can share uh, for the software systems. Uh, another use case is how a system like Fudaka is used to perform a real-time, a live 
and on the spot risk assessment for key ingredients and suppliers and also the facilities. Uh, in this, usually they need um, every year a couple of months to do all this assessment uh, thoroughly to make sure that they will consider all the risks, the frequency of these risks. Uh, and now uh, using an automated approach, they can save weeks that uh, have been previously spent in very complex, in dealing with very complex spreadsheets uh, and in performing on the fly a task that is used to take place uh, only once per year. So now they are more flexible. They can do that uh, very easily. Uh, they can consider all the available uh, incidents, food safety risks that are out there. Uh, and this simplifies the everyday work and gives them some more space to think and to decide to take uh, very important decisions. So mm -hmm. these so are a couple of use cases that I see. And they have to do with monitoring information, processing information, using it to take decisions. Quincy, what about you? What do you think? But you have to be unmuted so that we can hear you. Eh? Sorry about that. No <laughs> there, there's always one, right? <laughs> Apologies. So yeah, um, if you go to the next slide, uh, Nikos, uh, I'm going to take a slightly different direction here rather than talking specifically about software programs. Um, really, where are we today in terms of uh, industrialization? Uh, we've gone from uh, mechanization to mass production uh, to automation, and now we're in what, we're, what is basically being dubbed as Industry 4.0, as it was uh, called by the World Economic Forum back in 2015, where we're really starting to look at uh, be going beyond automation and really looking at uh, digitalization. Uh, there's a lot of e new uh, emerging technologies out there. Of course, a lot of those depend on software. If you go to the next slide, uh, Nikos. Uh, here's just a list of some of them, right? We're talking about Internet of Things, big data, machine learning, advanced analytics. Obviously, AI is one of the big topics and uh, that a lot of companies are talking about. There's a multitude of technologies that are emerging here as we're going into the digital age, right? And uh, as we get there, uh, the question then becomes is, as I mentioned earlier, what technology do I need to implement to solve certain problems or drive certain efficiencies within my particular business? And you cannot take them alone, right? You cannot just take and say, okay, artificial intelligence is going to solve all my business problems and it focus entirely on that. It's an, it's an important solution, but it's only going to be one of multiple solutions going forward. And then the question is, how do you integrate those different kinds of technologies? How do you ensure that they really benefit the business and that you get bang for your buck as you invest in them? So what I hear you describing is that apart from looking at software applications uh, at specific, separated use cases with lots of depth and value, as Yanis was describing, we have to keep in mind that now software is everywhere throughout the production life cycle. So there are so many systems run by software that have to talk to each other and flow and integrate and connect with what is coming next or what is working on top of them. Uh, this this is a, something that I didn't have in mind. It makes perfect sense to me and makes this an even more complex uh, environment. How do I make everything uh, flow properly? And, yeah, and again, your staff, Nikos, is not going to be an expert in each one of those technologies, right? Um, so they may have yeah. some knowledge in some, not in others. And again, I'm assuming most of the audience that we have with us today come from a food safety quality, perhaps a regulatory background. Uh, they're not going to be experts in AI, in machine learning, in data analysis, etc. Um, so the question then becomes is, even if I implement those particular technologies within my business, what are the resources that I need, both human and otherwise, to really make it an effective investment for my business? Hmm. But I do, I do hear you also highlighting a reality. The reality is that guys be prepared for lots of different software applications being a necessity. They are going to come. 
you it, it's something that we cannot avoid and the challenge of getting them to work together is going to be there huh? absolutely and you already highlighted the the backbone or at least the backbone in terms of decision making the data piece how can we make sure that data either from the internal world of an organization or from the external world what is happening out there it can flow it can be combined it can be aggregated analyzed and used to support decisions how does this work what do you think let me get your reflection again Yanis. yeah as i already mentioned Imagine that, that right now, with all these different systems uh, uh, deployed on a very large uh, food manufacturer, uh, a lot of data are generated, millions, trillions of data are generated every day. Data that have to do with uh, the testing, data that have to do with audit, audits, with uh, food safety specifications, regulatory data, environmental data from facilities and uh, uh, even production lines. So here I can I can share two use cases from my experience working with the uh, very large manufacturers. Uh, the first one is uh, how I have seen uh, multinational manufacturer companies, manufacturing companies, sorry, to be developing an internal food safety and quality assurance data lake by combining external risk data with internal data uh, for uh, audit reports for certification uh, and integrate them in a risk uh, assessment uh, tool or a dashboard typically it's a dashboard uh, and uh, they have tried developing the external horizon scanning service in-house uh, in order to get all this external data, external risk data, but they understood that this is something that is very hard to do because it has a lot of, uh, it has to do with a lot of work for harmonizing the data and it does not worth the investment. Uh, so this is, uh, therefore, uh, we see them uh, going for a subscription to an external risk landscape and uh, data feed like the one that we are providing. So this is the one use case. I see also uh, manufacturers uh, trying to use uh, the external risk information, but also regulatory information in order to build internal portals, knowledge portals, collecting all this information uh, and combining this information from uh, numerous external and internal data sources to be able to deliver this information to the experts that need, uh, need it in order to take very critical decisions for risk prevention. So these are the two use cases that uh, I have in mind, uh, thinking of uh, uh, the uh, food manufacturers that we are working with. So I, I hear you describing the infrastructural uh, and uh, backbone investment and work that has to, to to go into getting the data to be comparable and combinable if it is coming in different formats in different uh, uh, languages in different types even in different metric systems eh? maybe inside the organization in one geography we are measuring things one in one way in another geography we are measuring things using another system how can we make this data uh, measurements be combined in something that makes sense together. And then you're also referring to a, an example that is then working on how can we deliver this information and these insights uh, to our internal users uh, and make them accessible, discoverable through a single point of reference or multiple ones. Quinty, what do you think in terms of data? What do you hear? Yeah, so we're really looking at four different uh, elements here when we're looking at Industry 4.0 technologies. Um, and they all kind of link back to data, harmonization of data, 
uh, which then allows for good, solid decision making and ultimately drive efficiencies within the business, right? For that, we really see four key elements. So we see digitization, digitalization, automation, and culture, right? So we're talking about digitalization that really enables businesses to detect, uh, detect incidents, take corrective action uh, to contain an anomalies, keep disruption uh, as small as possible, and understand what has happened. So basically allow you to do root cause analysis as well. When we're talking about digitalization, it really enables you to do some prediction when and where an incident might occur in the future, uh, predicting some high risk uh, sites or suppliers or ingredients. Uh, and that is really key to allocating your resources within your organization, both human and financial to provide the right oversight, testing, auditing, and maintenance of your entire food system, uh, particularly in this case, your food safety system. Uh, the third one then, automation, really helps to increase re uh, repeatability, right? Repeatability, sorry. Uh, it limits human error and ultimately helps prevent incidents through automatic uh, adaptation of critical parameters within your food safety system. And then finally is the culture. And here we're not so much talking about the culture of the people, but we're really talking about changing the mindset of the business, uh, ensuring that the models that the business is built on uh, move from being reactive to being preventive with the ultimate goal being for us to be predictive. Because the more that we can see ahead about what might be coming down the pipeline, and then we're talking three to five years down the line, maybe even 10 years down the line, rather than only using historical data uh, to predict what might be happening in the next six months. That really is where we as food safety professionals can really gain some very strong uh, insights and really do our job as best as possible and ultimately save lives because that's the business that we're in as food safety professionals. Now, in order to do that, uh, if you go to the next slide, Nikos, you do need to take a strategic approach. And I've already spoken a bit about this, but it's all about people, strategy, implementing that strategy, doing your future planning, working with external providers, suppliers, and partners, learn from them. We already spoke about that earlier. And then ultimately, and this is one of the key risks that particularly our members are concerned about is cybersecurity, right? Can AI, for example, be used as a backdoor for hackers to come into your actual business and, and your system? So uh, for example, some of our uh, members have set up uh, very extensive uh, internal teams uh, that also include some of the best uh, cybersecurity professionals that are around in our industry uh, to make sure that hackers do not uh, really get access to information that we don't want them to have. Yeah. Now, uh -huh. then, if you do this That's right, important. you go to the next slide. You're going, to, can, you're going to find a plethora of different kinds of advantages, right? From increased productivity and efficiency to reduction in cost, increased ROI, uh, increased customer satisfaction and consumer satisfaction, uh, quicker to market with your products. So there's a lot of different advantages we're starting to see as these new technologies are being adopted and implemented effectively within businesses. So... Uh, as we're seeing those benefits coming through uh, over time, we as a safe at least are looking to share some of those user cases, but it's still a little bit early days for us to do so. Mm. I, I really like the points that you are making, uh, Quincy. I want to, to focus on two things that you've said. First of all, you remind us that there is an end goal to this gain of getting all the data together and processing them and doing all these elaborate exercise and the end goal is having people becoming better in the way that they do their job and making sure that they can prevent something before it uh, we, we produce something that will uh, get someone sick or uh, to die because they ate uh, the consumed one of the products and this is essential in my eyes because throughout this journey that you explained from the basic stuff of making some information available. It's on paper, it will get lost. Let's make this available through digital. And all of these different and elaborate steps, it's very easy to fall in the trap of becoming too much about technology and missing 
the end goal. That it's not about technology. It has to do with supporting people that take decisions. Uh, and also making sure that when these people leave the organization, if they move or if they retire, the knowledge that they have stays and we don't lose it. And the other thing that I, I really liked in the point uh, that you made is that we don't we need to keep in mind that this data asset that we are building is a critical asset in business operations and an expensive asset in business operations, even though we don't see it like we see a factory, a manufacturing facility. So in the way the same way that we are concerned with things like securing our manufacturing facilities and making sure that they operate properly and nobody gets to interact and uh, harm them, we have to take the same concern in our intangible digital assets. Yep. It's, it's, it's something that I didn't have in mind. I really like the way that this conversation is going, guys. Now, our audience came here for the predictive part, the AI part. What do you think about this? Understanding and using these kind of technologies to become more proactive. Yanis. So I have several things here that I would like to share, but it's we will Stay need another webinar. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, we will need another. So I will focus on the most important. So I see applications of AI and food safety which are focusing uh, on identifying potential risks and highlighting products, ingredients, and suppliers of higher risk, uh, or identifying defective products using passive vision in the uh, production line. So there are several uh, applications that we see. I will focus more on the ones that I mentioned about uh, identifying potential risks in uh, ingredients and suppliers. So I see companies, uh, very large food manufacturers, to use the risk forecasts to generate reports that they can share with uh, their plants, manufacturing facilities, uh, to inform their HACCP plants. Uh, I see companies using uh, generative AI to support users in discovering and searching into uh, millions, hundreds of millions of uh, food safety incidents, informations which are announced uh, globally. Uh, I see also the companies to incorporate uh, the hazards forecasts to manage uh, the potential hazards and foreseeable hazards and to make sure that uh, uh, the ingredients and suppliers uh, are at low risk or to mitigate, to take critical decisions to mitigate the risk. And I see also how manufacturers are using uh, the forecasting models to identify early the increasing trend uh, of uh, an emerging issue. I will share a very specific example uh, in order to prevent such risk in their supply chain. So just to illustrate this through, through some, some examples, uh, they are uh, using the using AI, we can provide hazards forecasting in uh, Fudakai, and uh, the companies are incorporating this to identify which are the future uh, hazards, which ingredients will be affected, and of course, they are using this forecast and the forecasted hazards uh, and to see which are the suppliers that will be mostly affected by such uh, future hazards that uh, uh, we can, uh, for which we can predict the increasing trend. So this is the, the one case. Uh, and uh, the manufacturers are, are using this uh, forecast to identify uh, the emerging, uh, specific emerging threats in very critical ingredients that they are using. So we have, we are working with a manufacturer uh, here that was using uh, Fudakai at the time that we had the crisis with ETO. The Fudakai highlighted that there was an emerging risks, a risk for ethylene oxide and also forecasted the highly increasing trend. So uh, these trends, these forecasts can be also specific for, for the regions. So since he was uh, sourcing sesame from India and the risk for India was high, 
he decided to increase the, the sampling, the test sampling, and uh, finally he was uh, uh, changing. He changed uh, and explored alternative sourcing locations like Egypt in order to mitigate the risk. And uh, following and uh, monitoring the trends that are uh, forecasted, uh, if we go to the next slide, when our client uh, saw that uh, the predicted ETO incidence in the sesame seeds will significantly decrease, then he restored uh, the supply chain, the sourcing from India was restored. And when we are discussing this use case uh, together with our client, he he's saying that this was a very good example of how he, they managed to prevent risks in their products where they were using a lot of uh, sesame. So well, this is a very a yes. example. So. Yeah, this is a very specific use case. And it's the type of use case that really slowly builds confidence and understanding of how an example of such a technology. So you're, here you're showing uh, how forecasting can support decisions. Uh, and it takes time. And it takes lots of examples until this kind of uh, technology can be integrated and actually be trusted. Uh, this is also what I hear from the market. Quincy, what do you think? Yeah, so when it comes to food safety, really, we're still very much at an early initial nascent stage when it comes to uh, artificial intelligence, AI, uh, within the food safety space. We're starting to see it mainly being used right now for customer insights, customer complaints, customer satisfaction, um, and the analysis of big data sets. Uh, some use in quality, uh, but very little use so far in food safety. There's a few examples here and there that I can share if we have enough time. Where do I see um, the most benefit coming out of AI in the coming near term, let's say the next 12 to 24 months. One of them clearly is what uh, what Giannis was talking about. Uh, that is very much around what are some of the food safety trends, analyzing big data. Uh, there are some challenges around that. The accuracy isn't entirely there. Uh, one of our members is saying, look, we got about 68% accuracy. So what they're doing with the data is a little bit different. They're taking, uh, they're, they're throwing AI at it. Uh, they then know that the accuracy isn't 100%, but then they at least have done a first cut using AI and saved a lot of time and resource there. Then pass it on to their own internal food safety experts to then do a deep dive in those areas where they see potential risks emerging. Now, of course, 68% is good, but when we're dealing with lives, 68% is not good enough. I mean, we gotta be 100% accurate here, right? Because otherwise we cannot use blindly AI on its own. So we still need a lot of uh, human intervention uh, and uh, technical expertise. Uh, I, I personally see a tremendous amount of potential benefit coming out of machine learning and a lot of automation around that. Uh, and we're starting to see some significant investments in that space. Uh, and then the other one, obviously we spoke about earlier already around traceability uh, and what AI can bring to that, particularly in light of FISMA 204. What are some of the challenges? We've already spoken about the accuracy of data. I think another one is the need to continuously update and adjust the algorithms. So as we get more knowledge and as the data gets better and as AI itself gets better, we need to keep updating the algorithms that sit under, underneath that AI, that drive the AI in the first place. If not, then we're gonna start falling behind. So the algorithms need to keep being updated. And for that, you need the right knowledge and expertise to do it. Uh, the other one, and we spoke about this earlier as well as the interoperability of systems within your organization, but then also within your own supply chain, as well as across the industry. So if we don't focus on some of those challenges, we're not gonna be able to maximize the investment that we're making within AI. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it at that for now when it comes to AI. Um, but yeah, we, we see a tremendous amount of uh, potential uh, benefit going forward uh, if it's done right, but it's still early days and it needs to be taken into account with, excuse me, the overall investment that you're making in all of your technologies and don't just invest only in AI thinking that that is going to solve all your business problems. And now I hear you saying, first of all, that it's not something new. There are different departments within the same company 
that have been excelling in using this kind of technologies. On the other hand, there are some open questions that are very, very particular to food safety, like, for example, the accuracy issue. I will challenge you on what you've said just for the sake of conversation with something that I heard from one of the leaders in, uh, in, in a food manufacturer that said, even 40% of accuracy is good enough for me rather than having no signal at all. So this is an ongoing conversation about how much we can trust uh, such technologies. And then I, I also want to focus on the AI training part. How can we use these tools? It's not a straightforward uh, step. We have to understand the benefits and then train people to use such tools properly. That's very interesting. And we, we, we are enriching here the picture of transforming things. So I'm conscious of time. We have something like three minutes, but maybe we will run five minutes over. If there is any question that is pressing, let me check how is the flow of information in the open ones. Ah, I will ask you for some feedback on that. And then I will collect the questions from our audience and reply them uh, in the follow-up. Now, wrapping this up, and highlighting the key messages from our conversation. Let me start with an agreement that AI, at the end of the day, has to do with the digital transformation journey of an organization. It's just one of the many technologies that are there. It's quite transformative, and the potential is extremely promising but is yet another digital technology that has to be put in place. And this means that existing processes that are proven, that are running, that we can rely upon, they have to change. And this requires, you already said this, people, new ways of working, lots of money, and it's all about change management. And when we talk about change management, we should expect resistance. And if we look at some of the fundamental questions, or at least in the way that I see them, eh? I, I always like asking myself and asking colleagues that are working in the food industry, do you want, do you see your company becoming a technology organization, a more digital organization? Are you expanding into the digital space by adding and investing in these capabilities? I don't have an answer, but it's one of the existential questions that I hear people discussing a lot. I've already talked about the pitfall that at least in my eyes is the most dangerous one, becoming too much obsessed about technology and forgetting about the end goal, as Quincy, you mentioned. And I think, Yanis, you kind of highlighted the mentality that seems to be more effective, trying things, testing things, failing in putting things in place so that we can learn and improve the way that we are trying to deploy something. Rather than investing years and millions of resources and then having a project killed uh, before it actually delivers. Huh? Now, what is your key takeaway? If there is one thing from our conversation today that you would like to, to, to keep as a main message for our audience, what would that be? Quincy? So um, there's multiple technologies out there. AI isn't the only one, and it isn't going to be solving all your business problems. But it's coming. It's growing. It's important is definitely going to grow. And I think, Nikos, to your point earlier is we're going to have leaders and we're going to have laggers. It doesn't really matter which one of the two you are. It depends really on how you want to take it from a strategic point of view. But ultimately, take a strategic approach. Don't just think about, oh, I heard that my competitor has implemented this AI. I need to do the same. No, think about it. 
what works for your business. Make sure you get the right people involved within your organization to make the right decisions and then use the technology effectively to drive your food safety program forward. Take a strategic angle. Okay, that's very important and powerful. Yanis, what do you think? What's the key message today? Yeah, the key message that I am keeping from this very interesting discussion is that all these technologies make sense if they support critical decisions for uh, food safety risk prevention. And to support these critical decisions, the human factor is a very important part. So that, that's why it's very important for me, not only to educate that we mentioned, but also to work closely with the leaders that are taking these uh, very important decisions on a daily basis and to see how these technologies can be integrated in the, in the workflows and they can support uh, them in you know, taking the right decisions. So this is the what I'm keeping, because usually we focus very much, especially as an engineer, I focus very much on the technology part, but the human part is very, and the most important. I really like what you're saying, especially considering that maybe in the future, distant or not, there will be fully automated decisions that will be taking a product off the shelf because it is an algorithm considers this unsafe. We do this kind of use cases in online marketplaces, but at least for now, these kind of technologies are going to be used by people. So let's keep this in mind. It was such a pleasure to have you here and to have this conversation with you. The audience understands very well that I'm having experts with me and they they are welcoming additional opportunities to, to discuss with you guys. So feel free to reach out uh, either to the team of Agrono or to SAFE and Quincy. Find out more information about uh, what we're doing and then uh, request an opportunity to talk to us. It started as a webinar, as a session that would be devoted on AI, but we covered so many topics. And essentially, we arrived at the conclusion that it is about strategically investing into technology and linking it to the people that are using it. So I think that the, I will keep this as the combined key message from today. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank Thanks you. for the I hope it was helpful. Thank you. Wonderful. Bye-bye.